Um, all right, so our next speaker is my co-chair, Stephen West, will be ta talking about Luna Map, H is silent, Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper, Lunar, lunar Neutron Spectroscopy from a 6U CubeSat. Stephen, take it away. Well, good morning. Um, so I, my name is Stephen West, as Noah just said. I'm a graduate student at ASU. I'm also uh, privileged to be the project systems engineer for the Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper uh, CubeSat. And uh, once my slides pop up, we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, I think that is perfect. Oh, closer? All right, is that better? OK, perfect. So uh, LunaMap is a, a 6U CubeSat uh, manifest launch in SLCM1, along with IceCube and the, the Lucky 13. So. Uh, uh, part of this, this first generation of deep space CubeSats going out to these exciting uh, missions at the moon, asteroids, and beyond. Uh, we're a SLS, or an SMD, Science Mission Director at Simplex. That's the Small Innovative Missions for Planetary Exploration CubeSat, led by Craig Hardgrove at Arizona State University. And our objective is to map hydrogen enrichments at the lunar south pole at small spatial scales. And we'll touch on, on kind of the, the background to that in just a second. And of course, in doing so, we'll demonstrate neutron spectroscopy from a CubeSat. So uh, lunar, neutron lunar neutron spectroscopy has been a part of, of at least two recent uh, missions to the moon. Uh, lunar Prospector, of course, flew a, a helium-3-based neutron spectrometer when launched in 1998. And LRO, as Noah mentioned earlier, has the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector, or LEND, uh, on board as well. And these are two very different detectors. The uh, LPNS uh, on the Lunar Prospector is a, essentially an omnidirectional detector, so it's sensitive to neutrons from its nadir point all the way out to the limb of the moon, depending on its orbital altitude. Whereas LEND is flying a, a collimator, a, a way of uh, rejecting neutrons outside of a much smaller field of view. So kind of two different approaches. Uh, these graphics here, uh, this is a um, 2007 uh, paper by Rick Elphick and his collaborators where they use an uh, image reconstruction technique to kind of get below the intrinsic spatial resolution of the instrument and, and back out these small enrichments in permanently shattered regions at the South Pole. Uh, so we have up near 1% in Cabeus, uh, 1.8% uh, WH in Cabeus, and you know, 0.3 in kind of Shoemaker, Faustini, and Howarth, and you know, 0.5% or so at the pole. Uh, this is a result from LEND, which shows uh, slightly higher uh, abundances in kind of Shoemaker, Howarth, Faustini, but lower uh, across the, the, the majority of the pole. So from these two different detectors, we kind of get two different stories about the South Pole, but they are, they are different, and there's still uh, quite a bit in the literature discussing how those results can be rectified and, and how the, the collimator impacts it. Where LunaMap fits is we're going to uh, try to get these smaller spatial, uh, a, smaller spatial a smaller spatial resolution by flying lower, and we're going to use an uncommon detector more akin to Lunar Prospector uh, at that lower altitude to get these small, spatial uh, these small hydrogen enrichments. So the key is to fly a small spacecraft at a low altitude over the South Pole to get these uh, small hydrogen enrichments. An enabling technology for that, as, as Pamela mentioned about for IceCube, is our propulsion system. So we're also flying the BUSEC BIT-3 ion thruster, uh, which is an ion-fueled propulsion system. It is the only propulsion aboard our CubeSat, so it's doing all of our deep space maneuvers as well as all of our momentum management. Um, and the cartoon on the left is kind of our thrust vector and our CG. Um, that's our nominal kind of thrusting mode, and then we can gimbal it up to 10 degrees, which gives us a moment arm so we can desaturate a reaction wheel. So we have one propulsion system, and that's the key thing to deliver us the delta V we need to get into our science orbit within the mass and volume constraints that we have. Along with that uh, enabling propulsion system, we have a, a, a very clever trajectory put together by our mission designers, Anthony Genova and David Dunham. Uh, Anthony actually was here at NASA Ames. He's now uh, in grad school in, in Florida. And uh, uh, David Dunham is at Kinetics uh, in, in California. They both present this work at uh, the Spaceflight Mechanics meeting, so I'd refer you to that for the full explanation, the kind of the, 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 the whistle-stop tour. We launch an SLCM-1. We deploy about seven hours after launch. Um, we then spend a frantic five days doing a series of burns to target our first lunar flyby. That first flyby is critical to keeping us captured to the Earth-Moon system, so uh, again, a, a very nervous couple days for our team. Um, then we'll spend 70 days in our cruise getting, uh, setting up for a, a ballistic capture at the moon. We do an apogee maneuver. Uh, out here to raise our perigee to a lunar distance so we can capture when we arrive. We then capture into a high, nearly polar orbit, and we spend about 470 days slowly spiraling in. And again, that's kind of this long duration phase. Uh, our science orbit that we're targeting is a, a polar 15 by about 3,150 kilometer quasi-frozen orbit. So it is stable over time. We get about a month, uh, at least one to two months of stability in that orbit where there are no maneuvers required to maintain it. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll plan some cleanup maneuvers for uh, unmodeled perturbations, but there are no required maneuvers to stay in that orbit um, beyond those. 
the flight system that will, will take us there is a, a combination of, of COTS components from a lot of the, the small spacecraft uh, industry as well as some custom work that we're doing at ASU. ASU is building our chassis. Um, it's actually a very impressively light structure. I, I forget, I think it's, I want to say it's, I think it's almost a 1.5 kilograms for the structure, so it's a very, very lightweight structure, uh, all things considered. Uh, our instrument takes about 2U uh, on one of the, the smaller faces of the spacecraft. Bit 3, uh, MMA EHAWK plus solar arrays that goes about 90 watts of power at the start of the mission. Also flying the IRSD space transponder for X-band uh, transmit receive and tracking. Uh, and then BCT is providing our kind of bus system, so CDH, uh, Bliss Blue Canyon Technologies, uh, providing our bus system CDH, EPS, batteries, uh, and attitude control uh, and determination. And this is our, we, we just finished our 3D printed model, and I love to show it off because it, it, it's, it's now a real thing. And I'm always impressed at just actually how small it is, despite working on it kind of day in, day out. You forget that it really is, you know, the size of like four coffee cups or something. It's, it's very small. This is our instrument, the Miniature Neutron Spectrometer, or MINI-NS. Uh, we we're using an El Paso light scintillator called CLIC, so it produces a flash of light when it's uh, interacted with, when it interacts with a neutron uh, or a gamma ray. We're just looking at the neutrons, but it is sensitive to both. It's a, a novel scintillator material. We have eight two by four by six centimeter kind of bars of soap of CLIC uh, in, in an array. We have a, a, a thermal control to keep the crystal stable during our roughly 30 minute science observations, so we don't get a big temperature swing, which changes their output. Uh, we have boron carbide shielding to reduce our spacecraft backgrounds. We are very, very small spacecraft, so we don't have a lot of background from GCR because we're quite small. But uh, because we're so close to the moon, we actually have a, a, a um, sizable contribution from uh, lunar neutrons that interact in the spacecraft and it's scattered back from the detector. So we have some shielding to reduce that. And then cadmium on the front to reduce our sensitivity to thermal neutrons. We're just focusing on one uh, energy range of neutrons, the epithermal range, the mid-energy range of neutrons. And uh, we'll touch on why that uh, focus in just a second. And then we add the housing and the digital boards, and you have the combined instrument. We come in at about 3.3 kilograms for the instrument, and about two U's of volume for the mini NS. Uh, we have our, the EDU is now at ASU, going into environmental testing, some functional testing. We've got one uh, fully integrated click module in there, and the rest are kind of mass simulants uh, for the environmentals. We're missing about half of them in this picture, but they're, they're there now. Uh, this, this graphic here illustrates uh, why click is really cool. Uh, because we, you see a response from both gamma rays and neutrons, but the shape of the light pulse is distinguishable and different. So this is actually a, from a test at Radiation Monitoring Devices, the company that's building the instrument uh, in collaboration with ASU. Uh, the gamma rays kind of fill out this section here, and this is a sodium-22 source giving us those gamma rays, and the neutrons are all uh, separable by that pulse shape, uh, that characteristic pulse shape. You can form a ratio, this PACE, PSD, pulse shape discrimination ratio, and you can separate the neutrons from the gamma rays, and that's an AMB source of the neutrons. So for LunaMap, our data product is fundamentally just these neutrons, and we're not looking at the gamma rays uh, with this mission. This is a graphic that I, I've uh, borrowed from Tom Prettyman that kind of shows where these neutrons we're detecting come from, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so galactic cosmic rays are fundamentally the source. Um, so galactic cosmic ray intera interacts with about the top meter um, down to even potentially the top five meters of the lunar regolith. Um, you get scattering, absorption, nuclear interactions with the materials in the regolith, and then some very small number of those produced nuclear particles will leak back out. In this case, from this one simulation, single GCR ends up producing two gamma rays and two neutrons that escape the surface and potentially could reach your detector in orbit. So um, we're, we're looking for those, those neutrons and their energy, which is determined by the composition of the surface they've interacted with. Yeah. Uh, this, is, this plot then shows a spectrum of what that, those neutrons could look like. This is two simulations uh, with a fan, just showing a, a sample energy spectrum for what we consider kind of dry fan with about 50 ppm WH, and then a, a, a hydrated fan with about 2 weight percent of WH. And what we see is in the thermal region below about 0.4 EV, we see an enhancement in the hydrated fan uh, of the thermal neutrons, again below about 0.4 EV, and then we see a suppression of the epithermal neutrons, in the epithermal neutrons above 0.4 EV, corresponding to that hydration. So that's, funnily, that is what LunaMap's signal is, is this difference between the thermal and the epithermal. Thermals are well characterized, so by detecting the epithermal neutrons, we can get at this, this difference, and, and that's funnily how LunaMap looks for these hydrogen enrichments in the pole. Our approach to our science goals is incremental, so during our first flyby, we're really focusing on uh, instrument qualification. Our first flyby gets us down to 2,800 kilometers above the surface, so we spend about 30 minutes below 3,000 kilometers during our first flyby. So we'll turn the instrument on, we'll look for a, a lunar signal, the count rate should be around 3.1, 3.15 counts per second, and with that amount of time, we should be able to measure that count rate to about 
plus minus 0 0.04, 0 0.05 uh, counts per second, and give us some confidence the instrument's working, uh, qualify and demonstrate that we're operating the lunar environment on that first flyby, because uh, we then have you know, a pretty long wait before we get down to our science orbit from there. Um, in our science orbit, uh, in that polar orbit uh, with the 15 kilometer uh, perisaline, we're really focusing our signal over within about a half a degree to a degree of the pole. These, these plots are the 15 kilometer uh, bins based off a simulated kind of uh, neutron uh, or a simulated uh, base map of hydrogen enhancements on the South Pole. And you see the majority of our counts are coming from that kind of center right around, uh, you know, with, right around the pole, a degree and a half, maybe a de or half a degree to a degree within the pole. Uh, and our uncertainty scales is about the square root of those total counts. So you kind of substitute that color bar for uh, uncertainty in counts. You'd have a, the same site type of plot. And then our uncertainty to, uh, to a 600 ppm enrichment, uh, we see runs from about 20 to 80. And again, this is some preliminary, some preliminary work we've been doing over the past few months that uh, gives you a sense of what we're talking in terms of uncertainties. And this is a, a very simplified base map that, that drives these kind of simulations and a, a sample of what a map that we make could potentially look like. Again, there, um, this preliminary work we've been doing. And you see that towards the pole, it's like Shackleton, this image we, we uh, mirrors the one from the LPNS results uh, here at Shackleton. We actually get pretty close in terms of uh, hydrogen abundance at that uh, point very close to the pole. Farther out from the pole, we have a much tougher time distinguishing the spatial extents and, and abundances. But that's to be expected, really focusing our signal over, over a small point. We just completed our critical design review in June of this year, uh, so we're all very relieved to, to be past that. Uh, we're looking forward to feedback from our board in the next few weeks, and then we'll be moving forward, ahead, moving ahead uh, from there with uh, any RFAs we get. Uh, we have an SLS safety review coming up, as, as Pamela mentioned, uh, working with a, integrating a low-cost uh, CubeSat with a, a flagship human exploration system is certainly a challenge. Uh, so we're, we're working very closely with them to, to undergo the safety review process and make sure we pose no threat uh, to the, the SLS and, and Orion spacecrafts that are primary for this, uh, this mission. We'll be going to assembly iteration and test the fourth quarter of this year after a review and a workshop with our review board to make sure we're ready to go into that phase. And then, of course, our launch is on SLCM-1 uh, no earlier uh, than 2019, as we've, as we've heard. I want to close just by highlighting the, the team behind this. This was kind of a theme that was mentioned a lot yesterday that you know, none of this work is done uh, by any single individual. So we have a fantastic team behind LunaMap, of course, led by Craig at ASU, our, our science team, uh, Tony Kolopreet, who's here at NASA Ames, uh, Mark Robinson at ASU, and then uh, Richard Starr, who's at Catholic University. Uh, we've got a number of industry partners, BUSEC, Blue Can Technologies, MMA, um, Arizona Space Technologies, uh, and Radiation Monitoring Devices, who are, of course, critical to putting this mission together. Our navigation partners at Kinetics, um, and then support from across uh, the university and industry. We've got grad students, uh, professors, uh, academic professionals, research professionals, and industry professionals all working together on this mission. It's a really exciting team. It's exciting to be a part of uh, this mission and a part of this kind of first generation of, of EM1 CubeSats. So, with that, I think I have a few minutes for uh, questions, but I will point out before I go to questions, if you want to have your own Luna map, just before CDR, we threw together a little fold your own uh, Luna map because I guess we were de-stressing before CDR, I don't know. Um, so you can check out this link here and uh, download and uh, fold your own Luna map and have your own CubeSat to fly around your office. So I'll not take any questions. Oh, excellent. What uh, en energy range of gamma rays are you uh, sensing? Ooh, so we're, uh, again, for LUMAP, we're, we're really focused just on the neutrons. As far as clicks uh, energy range on the gammas, I'd have to get back to you on an exact number, but I, I can get that to you today. I, off the top of my head, I don't recall uh, okay. the exact range, but I can get that to you. Again, click is sensitive to both, but for LUMAP, we're really just trying to focus on the simplest question uh, regarding hydrogen enrichment, hydrogen enhancement. So it's just the neutrons we're looking at with LUMAP. Um, though Click can also see gamma rays. How nervous are you about using the uh, EHOC solar arrays, considering they've never been tested mm -hmm. in so space, and if they were to fail and lock in a position, can you, com can you complete some of the science mission, or is it all lost? That's, that's a great question, and it, it, it certainly is something that we're, you know, that a lot of our time goes into to thinking about. You know, a lot of our systems are untested in space. Our propulsion system, the gimbal, you know, th we're, we're, there are a lot of kind of first time flights because really we're the first CubeSat of this type to fly along with the other 13. So it's, it, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, as far as uh, what kind of failure modes we can survive, 
that's one of those trades working in the low-cost mission space, right? It'd be great to go analyze all these failures, say, okay, if we lock them in a given position, what can we do? Can we, can we you know, rotate the spacecraft and still desat? You know, maybe, unfortunately, one of the trades we make is as a low-cost low mission is we don't have the luxury of analyzing all those failure modes at the outset. You know, certainly, if we find ourselves in a situation, we've got a great team, and we'll, we'll respond as best we can, but that's one of those trades you make in the low-cost space. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Move on, and again, we'll have time for questions.